Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Philippians chapter 3 as we continue in our exposition of Paul's letter to the Philippians. We'll focus on verses 8 through 14, but let us remind ourselves of where we've been as we delve into the midst of Paul's argument here, and we'll read beginning in verse 1 through verse 14. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having a righteous, uh, excuse me, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Let us seek God's help as we come to the preaching of His Word, that He would give us and uh, enlighten our understanding and that He would teach our hearts. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we pray that You would now draw near to Your people as we sit at Your feet to hear Your Word the very words of God. Father, we thank You that You have not left us in darkness. That, Lord, You have revealed Your salvation in the Scriptures. That You have given Your Son to be our righteousness. That You have revealed Him to us by the preaching of the Gospel and Your Spirit awakening our hearts. Your Spirit giving us a new love that was not there before a love for the God who made us and has redeemed us. Father, we thank You for Christ. We thank You that He is sufficient to bring us near to God. Lord, we thank You that You taught us inwardly to count as rubbish all those vain things that we once hoped in. You have taught us to flee from ourselves and to seek a righteousness that is given to us from outside of ourselves. Father, we pray that You would help us as a church to continue in this doctrine. Lord, that we would walk according to Christ as we learned Him. Lord, that we would stick steadfast to the truth of the Gospel. Lord, grant us not not to sway off the path. Lord, we pray for the sake of our witness and also for the sake of our own growth in Christ's likeness. Father, we pray as we turn to our text this morning that You would give us a greater love for Christ 
that He would be our pursuit in this life. Lord, we pray that with zeal and with passion, like the runners seeking to cross the finish line, we would run. That we would press on to know more of Christ. More of being conformed to His death and more of experiencing the power of His resurrection life. Father, we pray that Your Spirit would give us greater measures of faith, that He would bring Christ home to our hearts even more. Father, draw near to us, we pray. Help us as we all seek to grow in holiness, as we pursue Christ Himself and His likeness. Lord, You alone do this work. It is to You alone that we give glory that we are what we are by Your grace. Lord, help us to grow in even greater measures. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're jumping somewhat back into the middle of this section, chapter 3. And if you remember two weeks ago, in the first part of this, this, uh, this section, we saw what the Apostle Paul renounces. We saw what he t- has turned his back on. Um, in his denouncing the Judaizers' doctrine, he explains his own change in thinking with regards to the pursuit of the righteousness which God requires of us. And you remember he enumerated in detail his former trust in his religious pedigree. Um, Paul really was a man who in, external, in an external sense had everything going for him from the typical Jewish perspective. He was zealous for the law, zealous for the traditions of his fathers. He was a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He he is an up-and-coming rabbi. Even in terms of his zeal, he, he says he was a persecutor of the church. And yet something happened that totally changed his perspective. And that's what we focused on last time. Namely, he beheld the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when the righteous one was revealed to him, it made all of his own righteousness, which came from his obedience to the law, it made all of his own righteousness look to him as filthy rags. As he suddenly realized in in light of Christ that all of those things are worthless to him. that, that, That they are nothing to him. That they are sinking sand if he wants to stand upon them for righteousness. And so... In becoming a Christian, he explains how he threw uh, far from him, cast away from himself all those things, and he grabs a hold of something far better, far more secure, Christ himself. That's Paul's emphasis in this section, is the surpassing value or worth of possessing Christ himself. I had had a um, membership interview recently in which I asked, as I always do, what is the Gospel? And the the beginning of their response at least was, in one word, the Gospel is Christ. And that is profoundly true. Paul says, verse 8 here, for His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain who? Christ. And be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God which depends on faith. Brothers and sisters, I'll remind you again, the Gospel is not simply that we get benefits. Like the benefit of righteousness. The Gospel is that we get a person in whom dwells our righteousness. Christ is the Gospel. Christ is our justification. We we have no righteousness of our our own, no ability to stand before the holy majesty of God, but if we are found in Christ, we are found in the righteous one. Clothed in a righteousness that has no Achilles heel. A righteousness that has no uh, chink in the armor A righteousness that can successfully bring all who believe to glory. And if you're here and you're an unbeliever, if you weren't here a couple weeks ago when we opened up part one, this is how you must enter the kingdom of God. It is not through a righteousness that is inherent in you, but it is by receiving 
As we, as we sung with empty hands, Christ's righteousness, which is given to the sinner. Uh, you must come just as you are. And you must cast away all the vain things in which sinners like to put their hopes in for righteousness with God. Whether it be your religiosity, your own supposed goodness, the fact that you may think you're better than other people, we must come casting those things far from us with empty hands to receive the righteousness of God. As Paul puts it in verse 9, to be found in Him. To be found clothed in His righteousness, protected by Christ. That's our justification. That's what we considered last, last time. And now Paul shifts emphasis. He now, in the passage, the section we're going to consider this morning, he now focuses not so much on justification, but our own, as justified believers, our own all-consuming pursuit. Paul describes for us here what his all-consuming pursuit is in life, and it is the pursuit of knowing more deeply the One who has saved him. Notice verse 10, that I may know Him. Now, there's tension here in terms of thinking about the Christian life and God's redemption. The Scriptures speak of our salvation as something that already happened. It speaks of it as something that is happening and it speaks of it as something that will happen. Um, does Paul know Christ? Yes, right? But does he know Him in the perfect fullness with which he will one day know Him? No, not yet. And so there's a pursuit, day by day, a pursuit of greater knowledge of Christ. In fact, we could say the single greatest aspect of the Christian life is that it is a pursuit of knowing Christ Himself. Matthew Henry describes it this way. He called it, uh, quote, feeling the transforming efficacy and virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. I think that's exactly what Paul's getting at here. In other words, we're moving out of the discussion of our justification and we're moving into the discussion of what it means to live in Christ. Um, and I've said it before, I'll say it, Lord willing, many, many more times. Paul, this is something that's vital for the Christian to understand. Paul, who is known as the Apostle who emphasizes justification... While that's true, Paul does not equate the Gospel merely with justification. Um, justification is a primary foundational benefit we receive from Christ. The moment we believe, it gives us a right standing with God. But justification is not the only benefit that we receive from Christ. And for Paul, the more central description of the Christian life is union with Christ. When you believe in Christ, you get the whole Christ. Right? If, if you have one of Christ's benefits, you have the whole package because they come as one package in the one Savior. And just as much as Christ died and rose again to make me positionally righteous in terms of my standing before God, just as much as that, He also died and rose again in order that He might dwell in my heart by faith. That He might actually be formed in me. Uh, that we might know Him more deeply and image forth His image for His glory. He says in verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now let's just get the lay of the land just briefly on these two key verses. If you look at verse 10, in verse 10, Paul is speaking of the Christian's present experience in life. This is what this, the Christian actually experiences, this side of glory. He, he's describing the transformation over the course of our Christian life in which we more and more experience being conformed after the image of Christ's death and simultaneously experience the power of His resurrection in our lives. Okay, that's verse 10. Verse 11, Paul speaks of the future, our final glorification. Right? He calls it the resurrection from the dead. Uh, the resurrection of, the, of, of 
the dead here is not just, he's not just speaking generally in the sense that all men will be raised from the dead. He's speaking of final glorification for the Christian. Um, uh, th this is the prize of which he speaks in verse 14. Uh, for Paul, the uh, resurrection of the body is virtually synonymous with glory. It's synonymous with, with heaven. Um, Paul speaks similarly in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, when he says, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we what? We groan inwardly as we await the redemption of our bodies. That day stands for Paul, and it should as, as well for Christians, it stands as the great Christian hope, the great destination. Uh, that day when 1 Corinthians 13, 12 will be fulfilled. That I shall know Christ fully even as now I am fully known. And verse 10, so he's described the goal, the finish line. Verse 10 is the pathway that the Christian walks upon towards that great destination. Okay, in other words, those who are destined for the resurrection unto life in Christ pursue Christ now in their lives. The Puritans like to say that Christ is not only the door to heaven, but He is the way to heaven. Right? He is the one whom we pursue in the Christian life. Um, John Owen said, quote, There is no imagination so pernicious as this that persons not sanctified, not purified, not made holy in this life should afterward be taken into that state of blessedness which consists in the enjoyment of God. In other words, there's a connection between our destination, where we're going, glory, the resurrection from the dead, perfect knowledge of Christ, there's a connection between that goal and what our lives look like now. We pursue Christ. Um, you know, just a side note, this is, this is a place where much of today's Christianity is at odds with Paul's doctrine. Um, and, and it matters, and we should talk about this, and we should warn people, because people are deceived with regard to their standing with God. Uh, many people think becoming a Christian is a one-time thing. Um, you ask many people who are professing Christians, what is it that gives you confidence that you're genuinely a Christian? And they will often point, to you, uh, point you to things like a date that's written in their Bible. On this date so many years ago, I prayed the prayer. Or I uh, accepted Christ. Or I was baptized. Or I was added to the church. Um, or whatever it is. In other words, they think of the Christian life as a one-time event and nothing more. But for Paul... The evidence of a life in true union with Christ, the evidence of that is that there is tangible proof of the power of Christ's death and resurrection presently. He describes it here in two ways, positively and negatively, life and death. He speaks of our pursuit of Christ, our Christian life, as an experience of true spiritual life and that also there is death to sin and to the world. Let's consider, first of all, um, the resurrection. What does it mean to know the power of Christ's resurrection now? Well, it's fairly obvious. What is resurrection all about? Life, right? Uh, that's what resurrection is. Something that which was dead coming to life. Uh, Paul is, what Paul is getting at here is that a truly converted person, a true Christian, looks decisively different than the person who is outside of Christ. That there is a new principle of life in them. That's another thing that needs to be emphasized in our day. That there is a drastic difference between light and darkness, death and life. Um, because the Christian is nothing less than a new creation. And within the Christian dwells the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. According to Romans 1, verse 4, Paul also says that same Spirit now dwells in us, Romans 8, and gives life to our mortal bodies. If you're in Christ, you are spiritually alive. Which means you've been given new affections. It means you actually, though you were once a person who wanted nothing to do with God, you suppressed the truth uh, in unrighteousness, because of God's grace to you in Christ, you actually now love Christ. 
and you desire Christ and you want to know more of God and pursue Christ by obeying His commands, that power is yours owing to Christ's resurrection. The place where Paul elaborates on this most at length is Romans chapter 6. Turn, turn over there. I just want to read a few verses from Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, as you're probably familiar, is Paul's anticipating and answering an objection to his teaching. Uh, in Romans 3, 4, and 5, he has very clearly laid down that justification is given to us by faith in Christ alone apart from our works. And his whole argument is that God is the one who justifies the ungodly who comes to Him by faith for grace. And Paul has taught his doctrine of justification enough times to know how some certain sinners will twist that doctrine. He knows that some will hear that and they're going to think, if I'm justified freely as a gift of grace apart from anything that I do, then let me just believe in Christ and just go on sinning however I, I want. And here's how Paul words the, words the objection in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Some of us in this room thought that way. I did. I, I was one who professed to know Christ. I knew the Gospel had something to do with forgiving my sins, and I twisted that into thinking that that freed me then to go on living however I wanted. And I wasn't concerned about there being no evidence of loving Christ. No evidence of wanting to pursue Christ, wanting to obey Christ. I had no idea that the one who has been forgiven of their sins also presently experiences Christ's resurrection power over sin and my slavery to sin. Notice how Paul answers the objection. He answers it by showing us that grace does not merely forgive a sinner, but it transforms the sinner. In verse 2, certainly not. How, it's, a, it's unthinkable to Paul, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as, now notice the connection, that just as Christ was what? Raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should what? Also walk in newness of life. Being a Christian means that you've been brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. You have a new principle of life within you creating new affections, creating new goals for your life, uh, producing a different direction of your life. Uh, sin, when, once you are in union with Christ, sin and the world loses its sweetness to the believer. And Christ becomes what they, what they desire. Glance down at verses 12 and 14 as well. Uh, through 14. He says, Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that, the, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And in verse 14, notice this is not a command, verse 14, it is a statement. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I want to ask all of you this morning, are you spiritually alive? Have you experienced Philippians 3? The receiving of Christ's righteousness and the transformation of your own heart. Are there, genuinely, we should examine ourselves from time to time. Genuinely, with judgment day honesty, are there signs of life? Was there ever a change in the course of my direction? Did encountering Christ really make any difference at all in my life? Or am I just one that professes Christ with no evidence or fruit? of knowing Him? Do we genuinely have this pursuit? Do we know His resurrection life? Turn, turn back to Philippians 3. There's a second way that Paul describes his pursuit of Christ. Not only the experience of the power of the resurrection, but he also says 
that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, let me explain to you what I think Paul is talking about here and what he's not talking about here, Um, or at least not primarily. Romans 6, where we just were, kind of describes the the Christian experience in in, in a two-pronged way. We are dead to sin and we are alive to God, right? We're no longer enslaved to sin uh, by virtue of Christ's death and we have been raised to newness of life by virtue of his resurrection. Um, When Paul talks here about being conformed to his death, I don't think primarily he's thinking about it in the sense of Romans chapter 6. And the reason I say that is because um, he specifically couples being conformed to his death with his own suffering here. Okay? Um, Calvin actually picks up on this very, very astute observation. He says there are two aspects to our fellowship in the death of Christ. The first is what Romans 6 is talking about, what, what Calvin calls the mortification of the flesh, right? Is, is putting to death our remaining corruption. But then there's this second aspect, what Calvin calls the mortification of the outward man. And what he means by that, to borrow Paul's language, is the believer's continued experience of being crucified to the world and the world being crucified to him. It is the life that Jesus described, the life of the disciple, carrying our cross, taking up our cross, and following after Christ. Uh, Paul saw a strong link between his sharing in the sufferings of Christ and knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. Uh, I think this is something, I'll, I'll make a comment, this is something I think American Christians in particular need to think about. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 10 and 11 Paul describes his life this way. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in my body. He goes on in verse 11. For we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul saw his sufferings for Christ as the very means of knowing Christ more deeply and uh, in a greater way manifesting Christ. He says in that same epistle, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he opens the epistle, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. That's why Paul didn't resent his sufferings. We've seen Paul all throughout the first three chapters now of Philippians. We know his situation, and he's not grumbling, he's rejoicing. It's not that he enjoyed the sufferings themselves as an end in themselves, but he didn't resent them because they brought him closer to Christ. His sufferings brought home to his heart the riches of Christ's love in his sharing in the suffering of Christ. They brought him to an end of his own power. They taught him to rely more on him who raises the dead. And Christian, this is where I said I'd make a comment about us, we must also not resent or shrink from suffering God may be pleased to bring to the church. You remember chapter 1, verse 27, that it has been graced, literally, it has been graced to you not only to believe in His name, but also to suffer for His name. Suffering is a grace to the Christian because what it does is it darkens the lines between me and the world. It makes clear that my law is cast in with Christ's. Uh, It knocks out all of my earthly supports and it casts me more uh, firmly onto Christ Himself. And I think we, and I mean that as American Christians in general, and we are not immune, we need to change our attitude towards suffering. There, There are many Christians in America that think that suffering is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to us. And believe me, I know the temptation to think that way. I especially think that way when it it comes to thinking about my kids and what they might 
Lord willing, have to face if they become faithful Christians in their, in their generation. Uh, but we need to remember that God does great things through suffering. The chief example of that is when He saved billions through the suffering of Christ. In suffering, we don't get a better Christ, but we often get Christ better. It, it weds our hearts more tightly to Christ. Uh, it reveals more the strength of His grace. You think about it. Apart from suffering, Christ's grace is not often tested. And suffering proves the hold that Christ has upon each of His saints. And, and so, brothers and sisters, as we even think about our own context and we don't know what the future holds for the church and Christians, there's a sense in which we should have the attitude of so what if things really do get harder? And so what if things really do start to be turned against the church. And they, we, you know, we begin to be legitimately discriminated against because we're Christians and misrepresented and, and maligned. We, we should sing, like we already do, uh, that hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ. I can't remember which stanza it is. Let sorrow do its work. Send grief or pain. Sweet are thy messengers. Sweet their refrain. Why? when they can sing with me more love, O Christ, to thee. Paul says he pursues this with zeal. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul wants more of Christ now. He wants to be conformed more to the image of his death. If by any means he can obtain the resurrection of the dead. Now, that brings us to the, the second point part of this, of this portion. Then in verse uh, 12, Paul, he gives us a dose of reality, if you will. He brings us back to reality. He, he tells us, he's already told us what the goal is, to know more of Christ, more of the power of His resurrection, be conformed to His death. And now he, he gives us a candid qualification. Verse 12, he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, now, what has he not yet attained? He has not yet attained the fullness of knowing Christ. Right? The fullness of the experience of his resurrection and his death in his life. And by the way, I'll, I'll make one point of application to this. This verse is a death blow to any, any form of perfectionism in the Christian life. Any, any idea that at some point before glory, we will finally arrive. Paul here admits that even though he aims for Christ, he knows that he does not yet know Christ the way he wants to know Him. And there are, there are several things we could say about this. I just, I'll just i mention two here. First of all, e even the best Christians, and I don't like to use that phrase, even the best Christians should admit how far they fall from pursuing Christ perfectly. Indeed, the best Christians are the ones who are the first to admit it. They're more aware of their sin, their failures. Paul's heart groaned, Romans 8, groaned over the reality of remaining corruption and that the deceitful old man that is constantly trying to drag us behind and hindering us in our race towards Christ. So we, we should be eager to own how far we fall short. But secondly, if Paul has not attained his goal, the great apostle, how much less have we attained the goal? Right? If he presses on, how much more should we press on to make it our own? Ma Matthew Henry said this. He said, those who think they have enough grace give proof that they have little grace enough, or rather they have none at all. And then he says this, because wherever there is true grace, there is a desire of more grace and a pressing towards the perfection of grace. Paul says, but I press on. Okay? Now, I'll pause just for a moment here. It doesn't come through as clearly in English, though. You can see it. Verses 12 and 14, uh, 12 through 14, are heavy laden with the language used of runners running a marathon. Um, you can see that even in the language of the, the goal, right? The prize, the pressing on, the reaching forward to the things that are ahead. Paul says, but I press on. Think of a marathon runner 
that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Okay, now, think, think with me. Here's the picture. Paul is running the Christian race. He's got his eyes fixed upon the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That includes the resurrection, glorification, perfect knowledge of Christ. He's pressing on that he may lay hold of the prize for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of him. You, know, you notice that language there. Um, that's an interesting picture. Let me, let me read the words of Matthew Poole. He says, This is a metaphor borrowed from those that run in a race, one runner taking hold of another to draw him after himself to win the prize as well as himself. If you've ever seen a race where one runner uh, stumbles or falls, gets hurt, and, and the others, either another runner or, or a group of them, they stop the race and they help them up and they all walk across the finish line together. That's something of, of the idea here, of, of what is going on here. Um, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm not yet at the finish line. I, I have many failures, many hindrances, but I'm still running towards the goal. And the reason I'm still running is because Christ, as it were, has grabbed a hold of my arm and is pulling me towards the prize with Himself. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent picture of the Christian life and the pursuit of Christ. I pursue Christ because Jesus has first pursued me and is now pulling me towards the finish line. Suffering, being conformed to His death, knowing the power of His resurre resurrection is Jesus bringing me closer to the finish line of glory. Uh, it sounds a lot like Hebrews 12, right? Let us run the race with endurance that has been set before us. Looking where? Unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter or finisher of our faith. Christian, like Paul, you know that you are not what you ought to be. You are not what you could be and maybe should be. But do you realize that the only reason you are not what you once were and the reason you've made any progress at all towards obtaining the resurrection from the dead is because Christ is graciously leading us, pulling us, empowering us by His grace. That gives us encouragement in our pursuit of Christ that we pursue Him because He has laid hold of us. He says in, in verse 13, he says, brethren, I do not, he, he really makes the same sort of admission here, I do not count myself to have apprehended or laid hold of it, but one thing I do, and he's continuing the runner marathon or metaphor here, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I have to make an admission at this point. Uh, this week I had my, what I once always held as my interpretation of this passage, I had it changed. Um, I, I understood it wrong. I often read this verse, perhaps you did too, and thought Paul is talking about forgetting, the Christian forgetting all of my failures in the past, right? All the bad things. Um, like, you know, just let the past be the past, move forward. Um, and while I think there's truth to that, I do think the Christian has to be careful not to let past failures so consume them that it actually hinders them from making progress in the present. I don't think that that's all that Paul's talking about here. Here, when Paul says forgetting what lies behind, Paul is including even the good things, even the progress that he has made in the, in the Christian life. Let me explain. I'll use the running metaphor. What use is it in the 400-yard dash if the runner at the 300-yard mark stops to admire all the ground that he's covered? N Those first 300 yards are useless to him unless he finishes the race, right? No one brags about running 300 yards in a 400-yard dash. Even when you're at the 399-yard mark, you are still focused on getting that last yard and breaking through the ribbon. That's how the racer, uh, the runner runs. Paul is saying here, similarly, in his Christian race and his pursuit of Christ, 
even with all the real progress he has made, like a runner with his eye on the finish line, he's not content to rest in how far he has come, but like a runner, he has his eye on the finish line and he wants to get all the way home. Okay, he wants, he wants the prize. He wants all of Christ in all of his fullness. And obviously, we need to understand analogies break down. Right? When Paul says forgetting what lies behind, there are limitations to that. That doesn't mean that we literally should forget our past, particularly the mercies of God. This is not calling us to forget our Ebenezers and all those, all those things. But we don't rest content with our current progress. Um, it, it, as if I've got enough grace now. I've got, an, I've got enough of Christ. But we are always running. There's a holy discontentedness, if you will, for further progress in knowing Christ. Uh, Matthew Henry again summarizes it. He says, Paul forgot the things which were behind so as not to be content with present measures of grace. He was still for having more and more. And, and he goes on to say, so Paul reaches forward. He stretches himself forward, bearing towards his point. That, those, that word there, reaching forward, straining forward, it describes the posture of the Christian life till all the way to the moment of our death. You think of a runner uh, finishing you know, the 400-yard dash. The runner doesn't slow down his pace in the last 10 yards so that he can cross the finish line walking. Right? He runs full strength until he hits the finish line. Likewise, Christians, we will pass into heaven with a forward posture. We, we run towards heaven. Jesus said that the kingdom is taken by violence. That there's a holy violence, a striving, an agonizing to make our way toward the goal. Uh, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9.27, I beat my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Brothers and sisters, we never give up on the pursuit of knowing Christ. All the days of our lives. The older we get, the steeper the climb gets. But the more we press on. Matthew Henry says, I endeavor to get more grace and to do more good and to never think that I have done enough. Paul describes, just a last comment before we turn to application, he describes the goal as the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Christian, we are promised heaven. The moment we have union with Christ, our victory is assured, it's, it's promised. And we will, by the grace of God, arrive and receive that prize, the upward call of God. But notice Paul emphasizes it is the upward call of God in Christ. We will only get there because of Christ. It is His grace that goes before us, and it is His grace that will carry us all the way there. Now, I want to turn as we draw to a close this morning to our application. I have three, three key things that we learn from these, uh, these verses regarding the Christian life in terms of how we think about our pursuit of Christ here on earth. Three brief things. Number one, this passage warns us against dreaming of anything like perfectionism. I mentioned, I would say, some application regarding that. There will never, Christian, hear me, there will never be a day in this life in which you say, I've made it. In which you can rest. In which you can say, I've got all of Christ that there is to be had. No, these words, not that I have already obtained it, should be what we remind ourselves of every single day. That there is more ground to be covered. That there's more sin to be discovered in my heart and to be resisted and to be put to death. Uh, that there are more good works to be performed by the grace of God. There's more intimate knowledge of Christ to be experienced and discovered. Uh, Christian, we, we need to begin every day realizing God's main concern is my pursuit of Christ. There is room for me to grow, room for me to improve, and we need to pray asking that God would help us to gain ground. 
That this even has application as well as we, even in terms of how we think about our, our leaders. Um, there are qualifications of maturity laid down for us, for elders and for deacons, but God forbid that anyone should ever think that that means that elders and deacons are somehow sinless, that, that they've somehow arrived. Uh, we, leaders in the church, are just as much repenters and confessors as you are. <laughs> We feel, like Paul did, the, the pole of the old man constantly seeking to get its uh, hands around our ankles and trip us up as we are seeking to know Christ better. Uh, th- this gives us perspective and grounding in the Christian life of what to expect. Um, it is always a war. We are always pressing on and never arriving. However, this is the second thing. This passage also warns us against defeatism or what we might call no-change Christianity. While it is true that we know we will not obtain perfection in this life, we uh, we need to be reminded, as Paul reminds us here, the Gospel really does change you. Right? The Gospel is not just forensic. It actually is the renewal of your heart. A new direction given to you. You are not the same person you were when you were outside of Christ. Because you possess the power of His resurrection. Um, You are a new creation with a connection to the all-powerful Christ by His Spirit who dwells in you. Uh, Paul said, Romans 6, sin will have no dominion over you. I know I have a testimony like this, and I know there's a few of us in the congregation who have similar testimonies. That we, there was a time when we professed to be a Christian even when we weren't, and we had absolutely no power over sin. Um, sin still had us in, our, in its grip, and Christ didn't seem to make any bit of difference. And when you came to truly know Christ, you felt like, I'm alive for the first time. Something has changed. The, the lights come on, and suddenly you have actual power to resist the sin that once enslaved you. That's true of every believer to some degree. You have new taste buds of holiness given to you in the new birth and a desire for Him who is holiness incarnate. There there is a war between you and sin now. But but there's actually a war, and that's good news. Uh, It's back and forth, and the battle rages on, but at least you're fighting when before you're sedated in sin. So that's the second thing is that we should, it should guard against defeatism. But then the third thing, and I just want to close briefly here. Even though we are told we will not obtain perfection, that that would be a vain hope in this life, and that we also likewise shouldn't fall into defeatism, the emphasis of Paul in the New Testament is that it encourages us towards progress. That we will make genuine, true progress in knowing Christ more deeply. In other words, as I've said before, I think we need to have an optimism about our sanctification. That yes, we have an enemy. There's an old man. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And that we actually now have, by the promises of God, by the power of His Spirit, ability to gain ground. Um, Christ has laid hold of us. And Christ, if He has laid hold of us, He will not let us remain where we are. Right? He, he lays hold of us so that we may lay hold of the prize. That means He's bringing us closer and closer. Um, that, that should motivate us, Christian. We need to believe God's Word just as much for our sanctification as we do for our justification. And that should motivate us to take God at His Word for our sanctification and to pursue with vigor Christ's likeness to pursue the power that God promises to give in Christ. Christian, what are the sins that are dogging you? What what are the repeated things that you find yourself confessing again and again? What are those things that eclipse Christ from your view? We need to remember that God can and He will, as we trust Him, help us to make progress in the Christian life. Christian, stir up the grace of God that is in you. Seek to lay hold on the One who has laid hold of you. 
strive with holy zeal to press into Christ. If you don't know even where to start, pray. Pray that God would give you a desire for nothing else than to know the power of Christ's resurrection. Christian, be honest. Do do, um, the art of soul searching. Have you left off reading your Bible? There, There is no surer way to grow lukewarm and to go off the path than to leave off hearing from God Himself. Have you given up watchfulness in your Christian life and you've turned outside of the way? Look again to Christ. Psalm, pray Psalm 119.37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Brothers and sisters, let us all hear the admonition of God's Word. Let us shake off lethargy. Let us shake off sleep. Uh, We need these constant reminders from God to keep us running. Let us cast aside the sin which so easily entangles us and fix our sights on Christ Himself, the One who authored the beginning of our faith and the One who is the finisher of our faith. Christ is a faithful Redeemer. He has not begun something He will not finish. He has laid hold of us and He will love us to the end by bringing us so that we may grab hold of that great prize of knowing Christ fully. Amen. Let's pray. May God write these things upon our hearts. Father, we pray for more love for Christ, more of a desire to pursue Him. Lord, convict us when we are growing lukewarm, when we are entertaining worldliness when we are allowing things to draw us away, to draw away our our focus from that great prize of knowing Christ in perfection. Father, be gracious to us. We pray for any here who don't know Christ. They don't even profess to know Christ. We pray, Lord, that You'd be merciful to them. Enlighten their eyes to their need of grace. Enlighten their minds to the Christ who is the only one who can give us grace, who can bring us, to, uh, bring us to You, Father. Father, we pray for any who are here and perhaps they do and have professed faith and yet there is no evidence of experiencing Christ's resurrection life. There's no evidence of being conformed to His death. Lord, we pray for them. If there are any who are self-deceived, that You would open their eyes Cause them to truly embrace Christ. To truly receive grace. To not profess His name in vain. Father, bless us the remainder of our Lord's Day. We pray that You would be with us in our fellowship, in our conversation. Lord, help us to encourage one another. Help us to remember that we are all pilgrims. We are running together. Lord, help us to be uh, be those who come alongside and speak the words of truth that build our brother or our sister up. Lord, we all need the means of grace. Help us, we pray. We ask that You would continue to form Christ in, our, in Your people. Lord, help us to more pursue the knowledge of Christ. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction.